he's possessed by Black Bart the Pirate. He'll be perfect for an Encounters episode. You just give me some pictures. You're here. Welcome. You brought me here to play backgammon. I like to keep busy while I talk. Can we do something a little more interesting? Naked checkers? Well, I'm just kidding. Chess. Chess it is. So why did you ask me to do this interview? Out of everyone in the entertainment world, you despise me the most. I didn't randomly decide not to like you. I'm doing it on purpose. Why? Everything you do is built on lies. Well, my Encounters TV show exaggerates the truth for entertainment. That's called drama. That is the best justification for lying I have ever heard. You have a very odd way of looking at things. I'm a reporter. The truth means everything. I'm a producer. Entertainment means everything, and most people don't know what the truth is anyway. I can sniff a lie out in record time. Okay. Then I'll tell you a lie, and you won't know what it is until I tell you what it is. Doubt it. And when I reveal the truth, you have to admit that the lie made for better drama. Deal. So where's your crew? You're looking at it. Big shot columnist with the times, and you gotta do your own grunt work. Oh, in case you hadn't noticed, print media is dying. I'm responsible for producing all the online content for my articles. Hmm. Now, if you worked for me, you'd have somebody doing that for you. I would never work for you. So, are you married? Well, if you did your research, you'd already know that. I was just making small talk to make you feel more comfortable. You've been married three times, recently divorced from wife number three, when? Well, it was about the time that I started producing Encounters, but I don't think we came here to talk about my wives. No, we didn't. So why are you in jail? Because I'm evil. <laughs> I looked into your criminal record. Anything interesting? You don't have one. Well, Dave's still young. I even had our chief hacker at the newsroom do a forensic analysis on your files. You hacked me? We call it research. And she found nothing. No criminal record, no trace of tampering. Is that even ethical? Yes. See, bold-faced lie. You and I have more in common than you think. <laughs> so, are you married? If you must know, my fiance left me at the altar. Really? Yep. I said, I do, and he said, you're not it. And then he walked away. Ouch. I pray every day that he gets hit by a gas truck and tastes his own blood before he dies. Well, it's good to know you're at peace with that. I need more light. Well, just open up your iris, boost the gain, reset your white balance. I'd rather open the window. I wouldn't recommend it. What's that? Bullet hole. Drive-by shooting. That reminds me. I gotta text the sheriff, tell him I'm gonna fix that as per our previous conversation. They let prisoners have cell phones? 
Well, I'm not a prisoner. I mean, I am, but not like you think. Hold that thought. Okay. And we're rolling. Can you stand up right here? A little to your right? Perfect. Okay. Roger Namrak interview. Quiet on the set, scene one, take one. Action. Still calling the shots from jail? Oh, well, once a producer, always a producer. Slate and three, two. I'm Tara Alleran with The Times, coming to you from inside Brevard County Jail. Joining me today is the very successful and recently very reclusive producer, Roger Namrock. Roger's latest show, Encounters, focuses on the bizarre and unusual. Nice to meet you, Tara. Roger. Tell us about your show. Um, Encounters is an... Hold that thought. Gotta reset the camera. All right. Great, we're rolling. So, Encounters. Well, Encounters is an off-balance combination of science fiction, superstition, and conspiracy theory. But it's all rooted in some actual events. We explore the real, the unreal, and the beyond. And how did you first come up with the idea for Encounters? Well, it was um, 2017, and I just uh, landed a big distribution deal internationally for a cyber detective series that I produced. Uh, a couple years earlier. Was that after your documentary, The Orb I Live On? Yes, and things were good. Money, licensing deals. Then why Encounters? Well, so I'm at this conference and I run into the vice president of programming for a science fiction network. I tell him, I love your network, just to butter him up. And then I tell him, you have way too many reruns. And he agreed. So I ask him, what if I could produce a low-cost, schlocky science fiction show for late night? that was much cheaper than the reruns. And that was Encounters? No, that was a bold-faced lie. So now I'm in panic mode. Is that when you learned your lesson about lying and never did it again? No, that's when I double down and tell an even bigger lie, that I've got an entire pitch ready to present, but I don't have it with me. So I asked if we could meet after the conference. The birth of a sociopath. So he gives me his business card, asks me to send him the pitch, so I go back to the office and tell everybody we need a low-cost, schlocky science fiction show pronto. Is that when you stole the idea from your editor? Well, when you work for a company and you're paid for your creativity, any idea you generate belongs to the company. Sounds predatory. Sounds like business. So you buy, steal, borrow this idea from your editor? So he says to me, what if we did one of those supernatural investigation stories? So we start talking about what it takes to find that kind of stuff and investigate it, and we decide it's way too expensive, unless, unless we exploit some actual cases and then we just make up the rest of the details. Perfect, more lies. Are we actually going to play chess during this interview? Yeah, I can do both. <sighs> so that's how we came up with the show. Encounters. Alien encounters, werewolf sightings, spontaneous human combustion, even a story with a leprechaun. You're actually making my head hurt. So we put it all together and we pitch it to the VP. And he loves it? He says, I'd like to see a pilot first. So I tell him, we'll do you one better. Put together two or three episodes. So I set out fleshing out the script, the shooting, the casting, the post-production. All in all, takes about a year. It took a year to produce Alien Probe. Yeah, it's about a stripper who thinks she's probed by aliens. It's like deep investigative stuff. Here, mm. I've got several episodes on this. I've seen it, thanks. I mean, who doesn't want to see strippers and aliens on late night television? Me. You're just afraid to have fun. So, why didn't Encounters get picked up by this sci-fi network? Well, by the time we got it all done, the guy that we talked to, that VP had left the company and the new guy wanted nothing to do with it. Somehow, Encounters became wildly successful anyway. Well, at that time, you have YouTube, the internet's still exploding, there's a huge TV audience out there, and that 
audience loves the show. Okay, we're good. Wait, we're just getting started. And now we're just finishing. But you didn't ask enough questions. What? Wait a minute. You already have this story written in your head. Nope. You just showed up here to shoot the interview for an excuse to write the story. You never intended to give me a fair shake. A fair shake? You of all people have no right to talk about being fair. What's that supposed to mean? You really don't remember, do you? You're gonna have to narrow it down. You remember this? I've seen thousands of headshots. That was me. I was in my 20s and I auditioned for one of your movies. Which one? The Notorious Mrs. Foxworthy. I loved making that movie. I thought it would do better. You auditioned for it? I auditioned for you. And I take it that didn't go well? Nope. I remember your exact words to me. You're not Mrs. Foxworthy material. You're really more like a bimbo. I said that? Mm-hmm. I'm sure I was just trying to be honest. Honest? You were just being mean. When I asked you for a shot, you said, you're not it. And then you called out next. After that, my agent dropped me. I was out of time and money, and I had to take a job at the local I... paper just to pay my bills. So all this time, you've been carrying a grudge. Why do you keep looking at that? The bullet hole. It's, it's freaking me out. Because? I kind of have OCD. It makes me feel unsafe. It's a jail. Unsafe in a jail? It's open to the world. A bug could get in. It's a bullet hole from a drive-by. You're worried about a bug? I didn't come here to talk about me. I've got enough. Thanks. No, wait, don't go. Give me one good reason to stay. Because I'll give you the biggest story of your career. <laughs> I doubt it. And I'll, I'll apologize for being mean to you. Not good enough. To be honest, I, I need your help. Why should I help you? Because I'm not the person you think I am anymore. I'll prove it. I know I was wrong not to give you a chance. I'm sorry for that. But I need you to give me a chance. Is this some kind of trick? No. You being nice to me, apologizing? Now, how about we start by fixing this bullet hole that's bothering you? I've got a kit back here. Let me grab your bag and get it out of the way. You know, when you think about it, I helped make you a success. I retract my statement about you being nice. I mean, all I'm saying is, that first story you did, you were trashing me. Mm -hmm. But it got you noticed, it made you famous. So in a weird way... I owe you I... my success because I was really good at my job. Okay, bad example. No, please, congratulate yourself some more. Just get it on film first. Sorry. About what? About a lot of things. The way I treated you was wrong, but I don't do that to people anymore. Because you ran out of people? I got too successful, too fast. I was arrogant and rude, and I'm really sorry. Wow. I didn't expect a real apology. 
I really mean it. So, if you've learned your lesson about being a better person, then what are you doing differently? When I cast a show, I try and treat everyone fair and balanced. You know, I treat everyone like the golden rule. Okay. And where do you find all these people who've had real encounters to be on your episodes? Well, like I say on the show, I, I just basically put an ad in the newspaper. So, you're working on encounters, you're trying to be a better person. I still don't understand what any of this has to do with you being in jail. So, about a year ago, there was this gypsy lady. She was weird. And she wanted to be in one of my episodes. Isn't weird good TV? She was like creepy weird. Like so much so, I didn't want her anywhere near me, anywhere near my shows. And creepy gypsy lady did not like this. She handed me this box. Of? It's just a little wooden box and it had tarot cards in it. Mm -hmm. And apparently, a curse. Ooh, I like where this is going. And the curse, it intensifies with everyone I meet. And what does this curse do? I, I can't tell you. Because you can't or you won't? Because you won't believe me. How am I supposed to believe anything you say? Look, just know that this curse is the only reason that I'm living in a jail cell. Wait, you're living in this jail voluntarily? The curse intensifies with every person I meet, so I try and minimize my exposure to the outside world. This place helps me do that. It keeps the curse from getting stronger. I mean, I'm buddies with the sheriff. He lets me stay here. He doesn't mind. I just, I help out. I do things like fix the window. And I put him in one of my episodes. If you can't tell me what the curse does, can you tell me how to break it? I have to get the person who likes me the least to change their mind about me. And you think that's me? Why do you think I contacted you? I was hoping for a deathbed confession. I knew that it was you because, basically because you've never written anything nice about me. I've never seen anything about you that's nice to write about. See, that proves it, you're the one. You are seriously disturbed. I already said I don't like you already and apologizing isn't going to change my mind. Perfect. Oh, I have been stalked before, but this is taking things to a whole new level. You can leave anytime you want and I can't follow you. So that's hardly stalking. You need to let that glue dry. Watching glue dry on TV. This really is the best story of my career. Well, while we wait for that, let me show you something. Here, I'll plug this in. Do you have an audio presentation? Something like that. Please say it's not karaoke. Oh, come on. Don't say you hate it. It's just you, Roger. I hate only you. But you're gonna love this. What I would love is to get back to our interview. And the chess game? Sure. Who runs your company while you're in jail? Well, I do. I mean, I can do everything via Skype or FaceTime, but I worry about it. About what? I started that company from the ground up. I should be on the ground running it, and I miss it. The money, the lies, the bullying of people and employees at large? I don't do that. I'm different. And treatment's subjective. I mean, there's laws for that. I obey all the laws. What would your employees have to say about that? Well, I found there's two ways you can treat employees. You can underpay the bad ones and keep churning them, or you can overpay the good ones and keep them. And 
Which one are you? If you work for me, you see my appreciation in your paycheck, not just some crappy gift card at something like Christmas. What do you miss the most about working at the studio? The feeling. Of power. Of gratitude for life and everything that I have. Tilt your head down. Tilt my head down? Yeah. Just hold tight. I am. What are you doing? Well, you know, I'm pretty sure that aliens have kidnapped the real Roger Namrock and replaced him with an exact replica. I'm looking for the scar where the memory inching. Oh, so you do have a sense of humor. I do. All right. <clears throat> So, okay, so you're running your company from jail. Encounters is going into its second season when most people can't even break into commercials. That's what I like the most. Making commercials. No, the creativity of accomplishing something. Even if it's low quality schlock? Confucius says, there's no greater joy than putting into practice what you've learned. You're quoting philosophy. Does that surprise you? No, no, it's perfectly normal to be having an existential conversation with a cursed man who's self-imprisoned. Look, I've learned a lot about television and film production over the years. It gives me great joy to put that knowledge into practice. Okay. That's why you must Sing about it. Well, I'd have to do my hair and makeup first. Oh, right, of course. What was I thinking? <laughs> We've got to finish our chess game. Yes, we have to finish the chess game. So how did you first get into film? I went to college. Stanford. To, and then I dropped out and went into the Army. And when you got out? I went back to college and got my degree. Mechanical engineering. Yeah, I hated it. It was boring. And that's when you decided to get into production. Well, my brother was making a film, a really bad one, like threat level midnight bad. <laughs> but he was having more fun in life than I was, so I joined him. So we have your brother to thank for all the crap you create. Are you actually winning? You might want to get used to that. Do people actually visit you here? Yeah, I've got a few old friends, buddies that come by every once in a while. They came by New Year's Eve to cheer me up. They brought a bunch of booze and bottle rockets, and before you knew it, we were launching the rockets out of our zippers. Grown men do this? Yeah, it's how we got the hole in the window and some burnt genitals, fireworks. I thought you said it was a bullet hole. I exaggerated that already existing reality to make it a more cinematic experience. That was a lie? And most people call that entertainment when they see it on TV. That's how it works. I can't believe that was the lie. I was only doing it to illustrate my point. A bullet hole is much more impactful than some idiots blowing off fireworks. Do I have to admit you're right now? And now you understand how I make my show from a creative standpoint. Fine, you were right. It definitely makes for more riveting television. Thank you. Checkmate. Wait. While you were busy being creative, I was busy being smarter. I was distracted. I want a rematch. And people in hell want ice water. Come on, best two out of three. What do I get out of it? I'll tell you about the curse. When? Right after we watch the Alien Probe episode. I've already seen it. Okay, if you've seen it, what are the black dots? What black dots? If you'd seen it, you'd know what the black dots are. I zipped through it. So who's a liar now? Fine, we watch your episode, and then you tell me about this curse.
know, it's not every day that you get a phone call about an alien abduction, but recently I did. It was through an ad like this that I got a call from Linda Love. She's an exotic dancer at a strip club who says she was abducted and probed by aliens. Oh, right. This is excellent primetime television right here. We closed, it was about 2 a.m. And uh, I kind of snuck out the back door without a bouncer, which is against uh, normal policy, but just wanted to get home. So I was headed to my car and that's when it happened. When what happened? This really bright light swooped out of nowhere and before I knew it, I don't really know what happened. I, I blacked out and I woke up the next morning and uh, I was in my car <laughs> and I uh, was all sticky and I couldn't remember anything and I noticed that my bra and panties were missing. That's when I noticed the black spots. The black spots. Can you show them to me? Do you still have them? Oh, this is... This is the black spot. Oh, God. If you had watched the episode, you liar, you would know. Have you seen a doctor? No. <laughs> if I found someone to examine them for you? I don't know about that. Don't you want to know what happened? I'm taking it Extreme yes, close-ups. So. Okay, I'll line someone up <laughs> and we'll get them looked at. Okay. When we come back, we'll find out what the doctor discovered are definitely some sort of foreign material, perhaps perhaps a plastic. Uh, they're definitely not natural. That's the best actress you could find to play a stripper? But she was a real stripper. OK, so far we have met Linda Love. She's an exotic dancer who claims she was attacked by aliens. One thing is for sure, though, she has some strange, even mysterious dots on her body. OK, Linda, let's have a look at those spots. Dr. Steve. Oh, shiny, shiny dots. And there's others? Yeah. Four total from what I could find. And where else? Can you see anything? Any idea what it is? Yeah, these uh, are definitely some sort of foreign material, perhaps perhaps a plastic. Uh, they're definitely not natural. It's just, oh, that, oh. it. That had to hurt. Yeah. It's just glitter from a rough night. What do you think these dots are? Well, it's hard to say. I think we need more uh, <laughs> magnification. Uh, I'm going to send it down to the lab and have it <laughs> magnified <laughs> under the microscope. When we return, we'll go to the lab to find out more about those little black spots removed from Linda's body. So, about that examination. I'll answer all your questions at the end. Deal? <sighs> Welcome back to Encounters. You saw, just like I did, the doctor remove these tiny micro dots off the body of Linda Love. But what are they? And where did they come from? Hopefully, we're about to find out. No, we don't. They're all the same picture, except for some writing and numbering. Writing or numbering, what are they? They're not biological, and that's out of my realm of studies. Um, but I'd say they're microfilm or possibly micro dots. You want to take a look? Yeah. Wow. This story of Linda Love's alien encounter is just beginning. What you see next may shock some of you. Wait, that was on the black dots? You're about to find out. As you've seen, Linda Love, the exotic dancer, claims that she left the strip club one night only to wake up the next morning covered in tiny microfilm dots. Very but what do the dots right mean? Now. She the doesn't remember talking. a thing, mm. but could the dots be a clue to what happened to her that night? Let's find out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow, Carl, what a great looking girl. Really great. I know that. <laughs> Tell me what I don't know. Well, Hunter and I both agree that the characters on these pictures are some kind of numbers. His name's Hedra. They could be something Hedra? like octal Hedra. or base eight, the other guy. especially since they only have eight phalanges. You mean fingers and toes? Yeah. Hendra thinks these could be some kind of coordinates on a map. 
I think they all left a little mark behind saying that that part of her body had been inspected. You know, <laughs> kind of like when you buy clothes and it says inspected by number 13. Basically or it could be an elaborate hoax. It's a brand Sorry, Carl. Right. We right. just can't I be think sure. I think we should examine the girl. Oh. Wow. Well, that was interesting, but not conclusive. He's a so I decided I'd go back to the club <laughs> and nose around and see if I could talk to some of Linda's friends. Excuse me. Do you know Linda Love? Yeah, I know her. This is what she's doing. How long have you known her? I'm going to say a long time, but I know her. Do you know anything about this alien abduction? Let's not talk about it. Okay, so we'll talk in the ladies' room then. Did you see anything that night? No, none of us did. Typical, you know? What do you mean, typical? That money in her boobs. Well, Linda tells a lot of stories. Like, I didn't even know that. She's going to Dallas Beach earlier, that or her aunt died and left diamonds, but the diamonds never show. You know what I mean? All right. What else can you tell me about her? Well, she's got that big mouth. Yeah. She has a little bit of a tail. Can you tell me about that? Well, that's Baby. I work here, and I'm up next, so I need a change. Okay. <laughs> All for the investigation. Right. Right. Have you talked to her boyfriend? No. I like you know to get her outfit better. Um, yeah, so it's Johnny's something. I don't know. How does she get you know this off easy? Yeah, he's a photographer, oh, yeah, bartender, a and a sleaze. He has a studio on First Street behind that Irish pub. Johnny, I know where that is. All right, thank you very much. Hello? Hey, hey, who's out there? You Johnny? I can't bring the camera here. You Johnny? Might be. You know Linda Love? Are you the guy she's been talking to about the alien thing? Might be. Cool. What do you want to know? What did you see that night? I was not there. I was working at the bar that night. There's plenty of people who can tell you where I was. So how'd you find out about it? When she got home, she called me. Johnny rocks. He does rock. She told me. All about it. He's wearing that rock and roll shirt. One of the pants. Did you believe her story? Yes. Sure. Of course I do. You know why? Why? Because now when I bang her, my jump blows. You want to say it? No, no, no. no. God, no. no. That's just, okay. I'm uh, just messing with you, man. <laughs> so safe to assume you don't know anything. I know. I know. Maybe you'll even figure it out. Linda, you asked me to uh, investigate what happened to you, and I've done that. I have to honestly tell you my belief is that you were abducted by aliens. Is this spot? The evidence is scientifically yeah. inconclusive, but what I can tell you and show mm -hmm. you is what mm -hmm. those black dots are. Those are tiny photographs of you. <laughs> look at the look on her face. <laughs> Linda Love felt like oh, no. she'd been touched by aliens. Oh. But was she? Perhaps she's just a gullible girl with a clever photographer boyfriend. Or maybe she's the victim of a prank or a date rape drug. Oh. Think about that for the next few minutes, and I'll be back with a preview of our next encounter as I continue to explore the real, the unreal, and beyond. Uh, I mean, if you're an alien, wouldn't you want to probe her? Ugh, oh, gross. Hold on one second. Call. Namrock. Yeah. Slow down, slow down. Yeah? Whoa. So she married Bigfoot, says they made Bigfoot babies, and now they got a Bigfoot band. Like like a furry partridge family? It's... I, okay. No, it, let's see if we can get them on for next season. Okay. All right. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Bigfoot, please, yeah. <laughs> This is my life. Uh, another game? Okay. So what did the stripper have to do with that curse? Yeah. I was actually dating her. The stripper or the alien? Funny. The stripper gave you the curse? Close. It was actually about a year later. Uh, it was her mom. She's the gypsy lady who came to me with that lame idea for a show, and I rejected her, and then I turned around and 
used her daughter, put her on TV. So what we didn't realize at the time was the stripper, my girlfriend, just in it for the money. Stripper just in it for the money. Shocking. <laughs> yeah, funny. <laughs> it uh, made me realize I was blaming all my problems on wives one, two, and three. But and, the stripper? Right. So came to the same conclusion that I was going through the same relationship problems over and over again, so maybe it was me causing the problems. And what did you do? I Actually, I started a journal. You must have a lot of feelings. Business, marriage, all of that kind of thing. Um, put it all in there. You gonna publish your book? I was thinking about it, but right now it's just sort of a tool. For what? Just reflection, analyzation, looking at my life. You know, when I get all the way through it, I'll go back to the beginning and look at it and try and analyze what I've done wrong in my life. You should analyze your life right here. <laughs> you think you're gonna win this one, huh? I know I'm gonna win this time. And when I do, I will take my place as rifle ruler of Earth. Oh. Well, I suppose I will have to counter with a combination of dazzling moves to Aww. save the planet Earth. That screws up my plans. <laughs> Did you figure anything out? About what? Your life, the book. I tend to trust people too easily. And then when they betray me, it catches me off guard. You never see it coming. So how about you? Where'd you go to college? I got a scholarship to MIT for computer sciences, but I discovered that I really hated coding. So I auditioned for Tisch at NYU and got a degree in theater. And then I got a master's in film. Oh, degrees, like multiple. Yeah. Impressive. Mm -hmm. I really fell in love with acting, so I moved to LA to give it a shot. But I was drowning in debt from all those degrees, so. Is that when I screwed it up for you? It wasn't you. I should have tried harder. That's when you became a reporter. Yeah with a small weekly paper. Look at you now. You're the entertainment reporter to be reckoned with. I am drunk with power. Did you ever want to get back in front of the camera? I think about it. Do you want your own show? Just like that. Anything's possible. <laughs> I don't want to do a show on aliens. <laughs> no. I could do something you like. What's the best interview you ever did? Kevin Bacon and Kira Sedgwick. Beautiful couple. Good people. We do a show about the good people in Hollywood. There are already enough shows about celebrities. Yeah, but they're all like puff pieces that come straight from the studio or paparazzi and, and you know, magazine shows and things like that. This would be something different. We could do a show that focuses on celebrities for the good things they do. There's an idea. I'll think about it. That's perfect. Let me borrow your pen. What are you doing? I gotta write something down. What are you writing? Think about it. It's perfect if I do decide to make this into a book. Let me see the book. Ninety-nine things to do in jail? Things to keep busy with. I had a friend ask me what I do here to keep from going crazy. So I made a list. I like it. It's catchy. Hey. Number one, learn to access daily whether my actions align with my values and goals. It sounds a little silly when you say it out loud. It's all a little silly. I'm living in a jail. <laughs> Reclaim my dignity and self-esteem. 
Learn to love living without an iPhone, text, or email. Actually difficult. It's very hard. Become obsessed with Ayn Rand. Those are actually things that are pretty hard to do. And very thoughtful. Does that surprise you? Yeah. Make friends with Big Mofo. Oh, number 77. What kind of friends? Oh, uh, not like that. <laughs> big Mofo likes to watch television. One of the reasons I got the big screen TV, we all like to watch television. Well, one day, this new guy in here, we call him a fish in jail, he changed the channel on Big Mofo. Big Mofo did not like that. If this story ends in prison sex, you can stop. <laughs> no, he put x lax in this guy's milk, oh. and the guy drank every drop of it. Oh, this did not go well. No. It lasted for hours and hours on the toilet. We could oh. see and hear every minute of it. Ew. It's one of the reasons I went down and asked the sheriff if I could get a room divider. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, the whole thing did end with the prison rape scene out in the yard. Stop that. I'm just kidding. I'm going to stop lying for dramatic effect. I promised last time. Have ice cream for breakfast. Yeah, it's pretty good. You ever try it? I'm more of a coffee person. Really? I'll tell you what, if you do me a favor, put this last little bit of glue inside that, I'm gonna go down to the guard station and get you a cup of coffee. Okay. This is so weird. <laughs> you being nice? So how do you like the digs? Cozy. Coffee. Thank you. So, how would this show work? Well, we'd start with the concept that we have. Entertainment reporting with a positive spin. Right. Now apply your area of expertise. Profiling actors. Now make a list of people you want to interview. How many episodes? Usually 13. Profiling 13 actors and how they use their success to launch charitable foundations. Would you watch that show? Damn skippy, I would. And with your acting training, you'd be better on camera than most novice journalists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Your personality shines like a diamond. You've used that in a club before. <laughs> yeah, you think. No, you're one of the most beautiful, articulate women I can think of. Okay, what next? <laughs> Next would be shooting it. Would we shoot on location at their homes? Would we bring them to the studio? Aren't those my only two options? We could do it on the cheap and interview them via Skype or something and then get some video of them doing the celebrity thing and then cut it in with your stand-ups. Or we go to the charity headquarters so we can interview some of the other faces involved. Good idea. How much would a show like that cost? Well, I'm guessing maybe 25, 50 grand an episode. Times 13 is... Well, you don't have to do the math. First you'd do the pilot, and then we'd go for funding for the rest of uh, the money. Okay. So is that something you'd like to do? Maybe. Then what? Then it would be a matter of pitching. It's all about that dazzle. I know a guy who runs a network that I think would love a show like this. Name, please? Charlie Humbard. It's Up TV Network. They only run positive series. How does a guy like Charlie know you? <laughs> I can see your confusion, but I've known him for a long time, actually. That's a whole other story. Okay. So, if we make the pilot and he likes it... We're in. We have a deal. 50-50? Sure. Put it in writing? I wouldn't have any other way. Are we actually getting along? No. We're not? Not until you see what I really like to do. I suddenly feel cold. Is this what death feels like? <laughs> so, what kind of music do you like? The Three Bs. Is that a band? Beethoven, Bach, Brahms. You? I'm more of a Van Halen guy. Is that a band? You don't know who Van Halen is? Should I? Oh, now I'm screwed. 
It's not that big of a deal. It ruins my whole conversation about David Lee Roth versus Sammy Hagar and what a cool guy I am for knowing that. It's not that big of a deal. I'm pretty sure it is. Oh, they have a wiki page. What's it say? American rock band formed in 1972. They were huge. In the 70s and 80s. They had millions and millions of hits. They changed lead singers and kept the hits rolling. David Lee Roth, Sammy Hagar, Gary Sharon. Gary's the secret lead singer. We don't talk about him. Why is he secret? Hair was too short. <laughs> what are you doing back there? Just wait. Have a seat. Get ready for the show. Okay. <gasps> Are you ready? No. I'm gonna bring David Lee Roth back to life. Is he dead? No, he just hung up his assless chaps. And you're gonna sing? And jump around like there's no tomorrow! First, swig a jack, just to loosen up the vocal cords. Whiskey? What else do you have in here? Oh, I got a lot in here. You're about to see it. Brevard County Jail, are you ready to rock? I already said I was ready already. Are you ready to rock? I'm ready. What's that? This is how deaf people cheer. You're not deaf. Yeah, but the last concert I went to was a benefit for the deaf and hearing impaired. It's cool, right? Yeah, it's pretty cool. All right, let's make this show happen. All right! Brevard County Jail, are you ready? Yeah. Goes like this. You see, I'm just a gigolo, and everywhere I go, people know the part I'm playing. Wow. Paid for every dance, selling each romance. The saying, but there will come a day when youth will pass away, and then, well, what will they say about me? When the end comes, I know I was just a gigolo. Life goes on without me. <laughs> I'm just a gigolo, and everywhere I go, people know the part I'm playing. Paid for every dance, selling each romance. Oh, what the same. But there will come a day when youth will pass away. And then, hey, what will they say about me? Oh, when the end comes, I know I was just a gigolo. Life goes on without me, cause <laughs> I ain't got nobody. <laughs> nobody gets for me. Come and take a chance with me, cause I ain't so bad. Oh, that's a long set of friends got so oh, all the time. Johnny, Johnny, on a beat. Better, better, on a beat. I said, Bob. Bows de bows de bob. Did it, Bob. I ain't got nobody. Nobody. Nobody, nobody, oh, yes, I saw a man get so, oh, this happens all the time, shot it on a beat, get it, get it on a beat, I said, Lord, tell Sally, mama, big city, I got no
I'm conflicted. Now, this is the part where you're supposed to be having fun. Roger, you sing about being a gigolo, and because of that, you ain't got nobody, but isn't that your own fault? You're reading way too much in this. And you're telling me that life goes on without you? Well, yeah, I'd like that to be different, but still, this is just rock and roll we're doing here. And, and do you want some sweet mama to take a chance on you? Well, sure. Well, you'd have to work very hard to convince somebody of that. I see. It's cool. You just don't dig rock and roll music. But you're so good at it, I don't know what to think. Please back up to that part where you say I'm good at it. It's just that the music is very loud and crude, and I don't want to like it, but I sort of do. You know, wait, right there. What are you doing? Hang on. Come on, get up. Why? Come on, you're gonna sing with me. Oh, oh, oh I don't know come, how to sing. Come on, get up. Come over here, stand right here. Come on, it's just rock and roll. Okay, here, can you sing in this key? I can't hear your key. Oh, come on, here, take a drink of this. Mm -mm. No, come on, it'll loosen up your vocal cords, give you that sexy sound that is rock and roll. You're just trying to get me drunk. You're just afraid if you drink some of this, you might change your mind about me. Challenge accepted. There you go, that's the way it is. Yeah, now you're ready. Oh, now she's the hot mama. All right. Woo, here we go. Are you ready to do it? I'll start. Homely baby, lizzy, bully, boobily, homely baby, lizzy, bully, bop. I ain't got nobody. Yeah. Hey, oh, nobody cares for me. Nobody. Nobody. Oh, did I say it? I'm so sad and lonely. Yes, yeah, sad and lonely. Sad and lonely. Doing it? Yes, it's perfect. Some sweet mama, take a chance with me, cause I ain't so bad. No, sad yes. alone. Oh, is this right? This is perfect. Every time, Johnny on the bead, Johnny, Johnny on the bead. Oh yeah. All right. Big sad guy. God. No. That was great. <laughs> so do you ever perform as this David Lee guy? Oh, actually, I used to do it all the time. Let me show you. Come here. Okay. Come here. Sit, sit. These are pictures. Sit. These are pictures of back in the day when the band was still together. <laughs> He's so fun. Why don't you do this anymore? The curse. Are you ever gonna tell me what this curse does? Not yet. Fine. Well, what's the first thing you're gonna do when you break it? Um, I guess put my top down, head out on State Road 520, and drive off into the sunset. Is it pretty? Not particularly. Then why? It's the freedom. To drive and drive? And drive. What kind of car you got? I've got uh, a bunch, actually. About 10. What? Some of them are in there. Keep looking. They should be at the bottom. Oh, I love that one. That's a 71 Charger Super B with a 446 pack. Fast? Fast <laughs> enough that I got to meet the sheriff. 
He pulled you over for speeding? He did. And then he just gave me a warning because he loved the car so much. Well, you do have a way of making friends. Thank you. I think I do. But I can't wait to head out on 520. I used to take my 66 bed convertible out there. But I just got a brand new R8 Spider from a lady in Minnesota. There should be a picture of that. It's a white convertible. Yeah, that's it. Excellent. That's it. That's what? Excellent. It's a perfect slogan for your show. I'm Tara Alleron with Excellent Celebrity Stories. Sounds great. <laughs> I like it. Okay, now back to this 520 road trip. Okay. The top is down on the convertible. The Van Halens are on the radio. That's singular. Do not interrupt me. Go ahead. Sunblock on, sunglasses on. Seatbelts on. Remember, I drive fast. Then what? Then it turns to dust. The sun is a burnt orange. Can we add a wisp of magenta? Yes. And then the 520 werewolf appears. The, the, the what? And you suddenly realize that everything I've been telling you is true. Your curse is related to a werewolf. I told you, you weren't gonna believe me. You have to tell me everything. Only after you see the episode. Come on. Okay. Hello again. My name's Carl Smith. I'm a television reporter. And sometimes I find stories that my newsroom just won't cover. They're too bizarre, too far out there. But I like these kinds of stories. In fact, I seek them out with ads like this one in newspapers and online. One of these ads is how I found out about the bloody 520 werewolves. You can imagine that I get a lot of phone calls about these ads and it's up to me to determine whether the stories are real or unreal. I have to investigate them all. This is about one such investigation. The bloody 520 werewolves, 520 being State Road 520, that runs west through Florida. The road takes you from the East Atlantic coast all the way to the west side of Orlando. Recently, 520 has been expanded to four lanes, but it wasn't always that way. It used to be a small two-lane highway traveling through pitch blackness with swamps on each side of it. It was easy if you fell off the side of the road to lose your car in the swamp, never to be found again. The local newspaper dubbed it Bloody 520. So is it just the nature of this road that causes so many accidents, or is it something else? There are plenty of locals who think these accidents are being caused by something mysterious. Earl Ray Jones is one such person. Earl took me out to the exact location of his ghastly encounter with the bloody 520 werewolf, exceedingly insistent that we only go visit in the bright light of day. A somewhat frazzled and distraught Earl Ray Jones struggled as he came to grips with coming back to the very spot of the most horrific experience in his entire life. He went on to explain again in great detail the sequence of events and what he believed unfolded before him and his special lady friend that haunting evening. He proceeded to point out and show me miles and miles of chain link fence that he's convinced has been erected by the government. All steps to keep people safe in this ongoing battle of man versus myth. He's got an appetite. As long as he don't be eating me. I tell you, man, a bloodbath in there. I feel, I feel for them little guys, them little critters. Aw, he's got a heart. Did you hear that? <laughs> How could I confirm such a story? Well, when we oh come back, God. you'll hear from another person who says he encountered one of these bloody 520 werewolves. You are truly the king of shock. I can't believe people watch this stuff. I thought I might give this incident one more shot. So I placed a specific ad this time asking people to come forward if they thought that they'd seen a werewolf 
or anything else strange along 520. Say this area is haunted by werewolves. They stalk their prey when the moon is full. They love the swamp along 520. In the middle of the night, they startle the drivers to death. Or if they didn't die, they wish they did. Then, once they wreck, they tear the drivers out from their car, eat their flesh. They need the blood to feed and breed. As you just heard, Joshua paints a pretty gruesome picture of these werewolves. But when we come back, he'll show us what he believes are actual photos of the bloody 520 werewolves. Pay close attention to this part. It's really important. I can't wait. Joshua, what is it that makes you think the werewolves are responsible for all these accidents? My friends and I have seen them. So you've seen a werewolf? Yes, as I told you on the phone. One popped out the other night. Wait, tell me about that. Well, I was working at Grandpa's and finishing up like I always do. Finished the dishes and I started to take out the trash. When I was at the dumpster, I heard a noise. It was the clock going off. It was 12 o'clock, 12 chimes. And at the last chime, our dog started howling. And then it appeared. It was big and hairy and it stank. I was frozen with fear, but I knew I had to do something. When we return, we'll find out exactly what Joshua did next during his encounter with this bloody 520 werewolf. Why is this so important to you? Just keep watching, you'll see. Joshua's story is much more detailed than what Earl told us about the bloody 520 werewolves. Joshua has just come face to face with one of eye. these creatures. So Joshua, what did you do? I couldn't do anything, I was paralyzed. But fortunately, he didn't see me and he ran the other way. So I managed to take a picture. Why you took a glasses? picture? Yeah, as he was running away, I started to think, no one's gonna believe this. It's pretty blurry. Tell me what we're seeing here. How big is it? Well, he was smaller than I first thought. I don't know, maybe he was a young one, but I was glad he ran away. And what did you do next? Well, I waited a few minutes and lit up a cigarette, then I went over to the outhouse and took a look. And what did you see inside, Joshua? Feathers. Feathers and blood. I think he ate a chicken. And you say your friends have seen these werewolves, too? All I can say, everybody should just stay out of the woods at 520. <laughs> After leaving Joshua and Grandpa's, I decided this to check sheriff. in with law enforcement to see what oh. insight they could provide. I, I set up an interview in. with the sheriff of Brevard County. So, Sheriff, my understanding is your office is responsible for patrolling 520 on the west side of Coca. Is that correct? That's correct. We have jurisdiction of the roadway. However, when it comes to traffic accidents, uh, Florida Highway Patrol shares that jurisdiction as well, and they're, they're often called to work the accident. That's great. Some years back, it was uh, not a divided sheriff. four lane That's highway, great. it was only two <laughs> lanes, and it, it earned the nickname, I suppose, uh, Bloody 520. Why is that? Uh, we started hearing that name probably about the mid-70s, and I grew up in Cocoa Beach, and I remember when that name was being thrown about quite a bit, and it was, we associated it with the fact that it was a dangerous roadway because it was a two-lane roadway with high speed limits on it, and people frequently sped on it, and they would cross the lanes. There was no real protected barriers that divided the highways, and so there were a lot of on oncoming uh, direct crashes from one car to another. Were there any reports ever of any attacks by animals? No, I've never heard that. Can I assume that you've never heard any reports of werewolves being involved out there on 520? No, I've never heard of that, no. I did get one more email about that ad that I placed about werewolves on State Road 520. It was from a woman who wanted to meet me at this store. Hello, uh, I'm Carl from Encounters. You emailed me about the werewolf ad. What is this for? I'm looking for folks who know something about the werewolves in State Road 520. The politically correct term is lupine Americans, and you need to leave them alone. Just leave the werewolves alone. They're not doing anything to you. You rarely see them. They don't eat many. Leave them alone. So, Just leave them alone. So I assume you've seen werewolves or have some knowledge? That's none of your business and you really need to just leave the werewolves alone get out of here get out of here earl and joshua both insist that they saw a werewolf but did they that picture was pretty blurry it's clear though something was in that outhouse that night as for the smell maybe the outhouse just got shaken up a little bit or maybe just maybe i had dinner at grandpa's steakhouse and thought that it would make a good story for encounters. Think about that for a minute, and I'll be back with a preview of my next encounter as I investigate the real, the unreal, and beyond.
By the way. <gasps> Checkmate. How dare you? That just happened. And now we have to play a third game for the championship of Earth. Fine. Take your seat. I still don't understand what this alleged werewolf has to do with your curse. Well, I was looking for physical evidence. But what if physical evidence doesn't exist? Oh, you're talking in circles. What if becoming a werewolf comes from something else? Like from eating bad fish or something? Like from a curse. Well, that would be hard because curses aren't real. Let me show you something. <laughs> oh, Care no. to change your mind? How long have you had that? It happens with each cycle of the moon every month. It gets further and further up my leg. I'm getting it on my back. My fingernails are growing. I bite them off. You think you're a werewolf? I get cramps. My joints ache. My body is stretching out. Oh, that's called having a period. The gypsy lady put a curse on me. And I found out recently that I think she put a curse on the guy in the show, too. Who told you this? Your condition is called hypertrichosis. Does that come with the cycle of the moon? It's genetic. Look, this has been going on for almost a year. Mm -hmm. I've tried to go to doctors, even magicians, other gypsies. Have you tried to shrink? Look, I think I only have about an hour to free myself from this curse. Or what? Or it becomes permanent and irreversible. But not if the person who likes you the least changes their mind about you, right? Right. Fine, I like you, curse be gone. But I have to atone for my sins. Since when? Since she told me to. I was hoping you might have some ideas. Like drink blood from the eyes of a priest or something? No, that's gross. Pins and dolls made of the skin of your enemies? I can tell you're not taking this seriously. Oh, I'm very serious. Hold on, let me show you something. This is the wooden box I was telling you about. Mm. It's got the tarot cards right here. And all I can figure from the tarot cards is that I've created some kind of imbalance. In the universe. Okay, follow me here. This is the Five of Cups. Mm -hmm. This is the Magician. Mm -hmm. This is Death. Mm. But they all seem to fall in line behind this card. Justice. How'd you know that? Justice right there. Oh, yeah. <gasps> anyway, so this is the daughter of the Lord of Truth. And you think me liking you restores some kind of balance? Do you have a better idea? Let me see this box. Hmm. Oh, what are these etchings? I have no clue. I thought they were just decorations on the box. Hand me the pen out of my pocket. sort of a cipher wheel. What is that? The cipher wheels are usually an alphanumeric system where each letter of the alphabet corresponds to a number, but this one is trickier because it looks like it uses non-alphanumeric tokens. What? Each of these etchings corresponds to a different letter. 
but there don't seem to be any single letter words, so I just have to figure it out. The most common letter in the alphabet is E, followed by T and A. You're actually making my head hurt. Okay, so... This looks like it could be the E. And this one might be a K. What's it spell? Hold on, I'm working on it. I haven't done code well, in years. Hurry up if you could. It's got an S. Got it. Kiss feet. Kiss feet? That's what it says. Kiss feet of what? The gypsy lady. Her daughter? I'm gonna say me. Well, you have some kind of foot fetish? I'm the one whose mind you need to change. Why can't it be you kissing my hairy feet? It says here, and I'm paraphrasing, you must Kiss the feet of the woman who chooses you. So now you're choosing me. You must humble yourself and apologize. Oh, God. Here, take one. Okay. Got enough weirdness today, my brain hurts. Could use a little liquid painkiller. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Mm. I have to warn you, though, I am a very easily drunk person. Thirsty much? Are you going to drive me home when I'm wasted? <laughs> if you get rid of this curse. Mm. <clears throat> Do you got a backup plan? You could always stand here. <sighs> Plenty of cells. You could tell all your friends that you got drunk and you spent the night in jail. Excellent. There's that word again. Mm -hmm. Oh. Hmm. Oh, all gone. I feel a buzz coming. Oh. Aren't we near the space center? Count me down in five, four, three, two. I'm a drunk werewolf. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the one that needs to be counting down here. Oh, relax. I, only, I have less than an hour. You just take your mind off things and chill. Oh, I know. She can't be me. Wait. <clears throat> so. Where'd you grow up? Ugh, boring. I'm trying. Fine. I was born in New York, and I spent my whole life in L.A., but really, I grew up at summer camp. Summer camp? Yeah, everything I learned in life, I learned at summer camp. And everything in life is what? No matter how delicious it tastes, don't eat 37 ice cream push-up pops in a row. You did that? And then I got diarrhea. Oh, gross. It went in my shoes. Okay, we can stop that. And on my pillowcase. How, how does that even happen? And then I shot a gun. That must have... Hurt. And then I cried. Did you kill something? I was alone. Oh, I think you need to lay down. Don't ever, ever live in out of capacity of your life and never, ever, ever rely on anyone but yourself. Keep that in mind. Yeah. So where did you grow up? Santa Monica, California. Mm. And then in about 2001, I... Moved here to Florida to make that movie with my brother. You know, I actually still have a house outside this jail. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's in a place called Owlworth. It's over by Orlando. I live on a lake. Actually, um, it's called the Butler Chain of Lakes. Did you, did you know that they don't have income tax here in Florida? Okay, okay. So serious. Are you going to kiss my feet? 
Uh, metaphorically, I think all men kiss the feet of women. I mean with ear lips. I'm still trying to come up with another option. It wouldn't kill you, you know. Says a drunk woman who wants her feet kissed. I'm your last chance, buddy. I think there might be one other thing. You mean like a sex doll? Oh, I don't know what you're talking about. No, I'm talking about, I was thinking about the cycles of the moon. Have you? And how it causes gravitational effects here on Earth. Have you, have you seen a sex robot? And how I think that all of the things that are happening to me could be affected by the cycle of the moon. Would you stick your toilet parts that, in a machine? That's why I, I wanted to talk to an astronaut. I would. Thought that he would know. Answer about my those question. Facts. I'm gonna take that as a yes. Listen, just I think there's a scientific explanation for all of this. Just watch one more episode with me. Please. Please? Then I'll kiss your feet. Fine. But I'm feeling a little woozy from all of that boozy, and I hope that episode doesn't make me vomit. You'll be all right. Come here. Sit down. Come on. No. Come on. Booze is all gone anyway. You'll be fine after. Okay. Come over. Okay. 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 Sit down. Okay. Careful, careful, careful. All right, all right, all right. Relax. It was through an ad like this that I got a call from Buzz Shepard. He claims to be a former test pilot who saw aliens, real aliens, more than 50 years ago. In the late 1940s, I was flying jets on and off carriers for the U.S. Navy. Hell, I flew the first XFDA-1 Phantom right off the deck of the old Roosevelt Carrier. In 1946, they said that couldn't be done. Hmm, but I did it. It was a great and exciting time flying almost every day. Then, I got the call. I remember right doing yesterday, it right out of a hospital bed that I was stateside. One of the chiefs came running in and said that Commander you know. Harold Stassen was on the horn. I didn't know who the heck Harold Stassen was. Well, I took that call right away. Stassen said he was working on a secret government project and my country needed me because of my experience flying jets off of carriers. Plus, plus, I was curious about any secret project. The next day I got a flight on a real nifty plane, a brand new RD-6. Destination the Banana River Naval Air Station. Banana. I never heard of the Banana River. Anyway, it turned out that it is now on what is called Satellite Beach, Florida. It was a World War II bombing range, for God's oh, sakes. Shaped like a banana. Shortly That's after what I got there, it. the base mm. was transferred to the Air Force and became the Joint Range Proving Ground. All secret and very hush hush. How was I to know that one day it'd become the Cape Canaveral Launch Center that would eventually take us to the moon? That's the VAB. Well, well he's got it for the nurse. When I arrived, I would too. And walked she was into cute. the hangar. Mm -hmm. I was greeted by two very intimidating congregations a bunch of German scientists and a swarm of humongous mosquitoes. Uh, I don't know which was worse. I soon learned their plans for me. I didn't know it yet, but they were developing a rocket sled. That's why they wanted me. 
You see, to get planes to fly off carriers, we had to do all kinds of things. Ah, the Germans really loved this. Interesting story, isn't it? Buzz Shepard has a lot more to tell us and show us when we come back. You actually thought this guy was an astronaut and could help you? Well, I couldn't take any chances. I had to talk to him. Keep watching. Well, I didn't know it yet, but I wasn't going to fly. In fact, after that day, I never flew again. You see, it takes a lot of energy to get into flight. You need mucho energy to counteract Earth's gravity. So their plan was to stay on the ground and travel on a railroad track. And they had this real slick rocket rail car. I mean really slick. So early in the morning of April the 23rd, I got strapped into the car and was ready to launch. The countdown was relatively short. Less than two hours to complete fueling and the readiness checks. Then, three, two, one, oh. zero, varum! <laughs> the first rocket engine lift off and the steam charged piston thrust the train down the track. In a flash, the other two engines caught on. Oh, I mean instant acceleration. <laughs> then, when I regained my senses, I realized there was no noise. The cockpit was silent. All sound was behind me. Mm. Then, pop! This great white light came over me. That's when I first saw the alien beings. I saw them as clearly as I see you right now. You know, they're all around us. You just don't see them. This is a good one, isn't it? I don't know what to think. That's what the audience is supposed to think, too. You're watching Encounters. We just heard Buzz Shepard explain how he was blasted to light speed in 1952. When that happened, he says everything slowed down into slow motion. That's when he says he saw the aliens. Yes, it was like everything slowed down. And right there where I was, juxtaposed with all else in vibrant reality, I could see these aliens standing there next to me. Then boom, the shoots deployed and the aliens were gone. Is there anyone that can verify this story? Hey, I told you, I never saw any of them again. But I do have some blueprints. Huh. Where'd you get these plants? I had heard rumors about a project like this, but I don't think that they ever built it. This rocket sled, in its present form, would be pulling 150 Gs. That's 150 big ones. You would be destroyed. You would be crushed. No human's going to ever stand a force like that. Since the government wasn't saying anything, I thought I'd bring the plans to an aeronautical research team that I know of to see if they thought there was anything to them. Carl, as you can see here, what we've done is we've taken your plans and scanned them into the computer, used a computer to clean it up some, and then we compared it to the rocket technologies that existed in the 1950s. And our analysis is that this is consistent with the technologies and rocket designs of the 1950s. Okay. And then if you come over here, we had the computer make a rendering of, from those plans of what we thought the rocket train would have looked like. And that's it. That's it. Quite a hot rod. Now Buzz insists that he saw aliens in another dimension. But if that's true, why is there no record of it? Buzz tells these fanciful stories 
about test pilots that ejected at such high altitudes that their hands, feet, and legs blew up like balloons. But again, why is there no record of these test pilots ever existing? Could it be that this project, like the Navajo rocket right behind me, is a project that never really went anywhere? The Navajo went on to be known as the Never Go. Think about that for a few minutes, and I'll be back to tell you about our next encounter with the real, unreal, and beyond. I have to say, you are growing on me more and more. I mean, the show, the show is growing on me. Well, I was hoping you'd say that, but my countdown clock is almost over. Do I send some feet kissing in my near future? If I do it, it's on one condition. You are not in a position to barter. Up here, your feet. You want my feet on the table? Yep. Mm-mm. You got a better idea? On your knees. Oh, come on. Just put them up here. Is that a here? Is... Is that a clock ticking? Huh? <laughs> what are you doing? Oh, we are not recording. We are so recording this. No. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm. We'll do it. Here's the deal. Okay. Give me the deal. We'll do it your way. If you win the mm -hmm. chess game, we'll do it my way if I win the chess game. And if you win, I'll put my feet on the table. Deal? Fine. Okay. Checkmate. You did that on purpose. <laughs> That's the idea. You took the fun <laughs> out of it. Oh, come on. Mm-mm. Come on. Mm. I guess I forgot about the part that you might Enjoy me on my knees, kissing your feet. What's not to enjoy? All right, we'll do it your way. Really? Really. <laughs> on your knees. <laughs> the other one. Are we done? You may rise. All right, the <laughs> moment of truth. I'm ready. Oh, no. <laughs> Didn't work. <laughs> I'm out. Mm -hmm. I'm out of time. Mm -hmm. I'm out of options. Mm -hmm. I'm out of ideas. Mm -hmm. And now you're gonna leave. Aw, oh, why'd you say that? You want a wolf man for a boss? You are never my boss. We are 50-50. <laughs> I did the kissing thing. I did the spandex and wig thing. I did the regret thing. I did the apology thing. Did you mean it? Yeah. That's what I wanted to hear. Give me all your money. <laughs> I, I mean your cash. Give me all of your cash and a lighter. I don't... I might have a couple of bucks in my bag and a lighter. Okay. Hold on. What are you doing? Oh, big tipper. Some flame. Wow, that must have been a really old box. Oh, it feels so good. Check your leg. The hair's gone. My back. It's gone. <gasps> That's all we had to do? 
Burn it away? <laughs> Why are you laughing? No did, reason. Did you know this was going to happen? I could neither confirm nor deny these allegations. No, you have to tell the truth. Or what? Or I won't like you anymore. Ouch. And it'll prevent us from creating a TV show together. Aww. And we won't be able to create a beautiful relationship with a nurturing environment where feelings and mistakes are okay. Where do you come up with this stuff? Right here. Fine. The cipher wheel on the box said to burn the box and all of its contents to free yourself from the curse. So you lied about me kissing your feet. I just exaggerated the truth for dramatic purposes. It's what we do in the entertainment world. So you're a lying pyromaniac with a foot fetish. Yes, but you are free from the curse. Could this day get any better? No. <laughs> <laughs> Sunglasses? Check. Seatbelt? Check. Van Halen's? Even better. Here's my band, 1984. Excellent. Let's try. All right! <laughs> To where it all began I'm a straight shooting type And a hard living man Two thousand miles Of old man road And I'm driving off to heaven With you Blue skies Hanging over our heads On the road with you Our whole future's ahead Long way to go Where the air is hot Headed west to the Pacific with no reason to stop. Miles and miles of palm line roads. Baby, don't look back. I know just where to go. Every mile of highway from here to LA. A thousand little towns. They all got different names. We're going back to where it all began. I'm a straight shooting type and a hot blooded man. We got. Miles of open road, and I'm driving off to heaven with you. Long nights, I'm a traveling beast. It's a lonely existence when you go the distance. Big road trip, and it's gonna be good. So you fill up on gas, and I'll check under your hood. Fifteen miles, we'll be feeling okay. Cruising over 520 and I'm nearly halfway Driving all the way until the morning light I'll take care of you, make sure we'll be alright We're going back to where it all began See I'm a straight shooting type and a hard loving man Two thousand miles of open road And I'm driving into heaven with you Going back to where it all began. I'm a straight shooting type and a hard loving man. We got two thousand miles of open road, and I'm driving to heaven with you. Oh yeah, running out into the night. I can see the stars starting to twinkle in the sky above. Oh, that's when. Hear that werewolf howl. Oh. To where it all begins, I'm a straight shooting type and a hard living man. 